Do you like wrestling trivia? Then check out the five-star match game, the Pro Wrestling Quiz Show. I'm Joe Gagne, and every episode, I grill three contestants with five rounds of power-packed wrestling trivia. We have over 30 evergreen episodes in the archives covering WWE, AEW, Japan, Mexico, and much, 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 much more. Play along at home and check it out today. Hello, do you like New Japan Pro Wrestling? Are you a Shin Nihon freak? If so, check out the Super Jcast with Joel and Damon on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. And even if you fucking hate New Japan Pro Wrestling, listen to the Super Jcast anyway. Not just for our great show reviews, analysis, and pastrami sandwiches, mm-hmm. but there's also usually some dick jokes somewhere in the obligatory opening 30 minutes of absolute nonsense we chat about every single week. That's the Super Jcast for all all the best talk about New Japan Pro Wrestling, crisps, and pornography. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To the highway, in a brand new day, gotta let it go. So Welcome back to Open the Voice Gate for June 6th, 2023. We are members of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. You can find us on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast feed or on our own dedicated podcast feed on all podcast platforms and applications. You can follow us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. If you'd like to donate to the show, click the link in the show notes. It'll take you to our redcircle.com landing site. You click the red box that says sponsor this podcast and you can set up a one-time or reoccurring donation. No obligation whatsoever, but we would like to thank all of our previous donors. I'm one of your hosts. It's your old pal, Mike Spears. Joining alongside, as always, Case Slow. And Case, how are you doing this Tuesday? Anything going on with you, Mike? Anything you <laughs> want to talk about? <laughs> I, I, I mean, this is not going to be an episode where we start talking about other things before we get into it. Uh, you don't want I to talk we- about Texas Rangers baseball real quick as we have an international listening audience possibly listening for the first time? Yeah, I don't think this is the time for me to uh, bemoan the uh, uh, the recent Tommy John news, man. Th- thanks, man. Really what I needed right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, right. I'm, I'm doing well. I, I'm doing well. I'm glad to I'm be glad here. To this that, is a, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big week. Obviously, we'll, we'll get to the, the topic that most people are listening to for a second. But I, it's a, it was a massive week for Dragon Gate. A lot of news, a lot of big matches announced. I, I don't think people necessarily have let it soak in just how good the Kobe world card is as of right now without everything announced just yet we'll get into that in a little bit so this will be a, 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 a probably a very long podcast a noteworthy podcast and I'm doing well and I'm, I'm glad to be here with you like I am every week yeah this is we're we're thick in it I mean just taking the mile view from it we are now less than four weeks away from Kobe world we have a title picture to talk about but that's not what we will be talking about right now in the program. This is going to be one of those episodes where we'll, we'll see if we, if we cross into hour three, that there's good potential of that this week, but the lead topic today and what came out breaking on Friday, I'm going to quote at open voice gate on Twitter of which Mm -hmm. you recommend people to go follow and, and like, and subscribe all those things for that. But from the Open the Voice Gate Twitter account at Open Voice Gate, the uh, reports that SB Kento and Takuma Fujiwara are no longer with Dragon Gate are true. This has been confirmed through multiple sources. We'll have more information on the podcast on Tuesday with details not yet reported. So, Case, that this was from and this was spurred on. I think we could both say uh, that Dave Meltzer's reporting on the Observer. This week, he has a paragraph case. You just want to read that paragraph before we get into it. 
Yeah, so on the Observer that came out June 2nd of 2023, Dave said at the Dragon Gate section, he said, and I quote, SP Kento and Takuma Fujiwara, who are both in Mexico, are no longer affiliated with the company at this point. Exactly what happened is unclear. Past they are now based in Mexico. Kento was pushed like crazy right off the bat and hoped to be one of the long-term future superstars. Uh, this is classic Dave writing, but for his career comma this is a giant trajectory change fujiwara had shown a lot of promise as well end quote yes so dave brought up that to everyone's attention and i think it's now worth talking about uh sb kento kento kubune and and takuma fujiwara what has really kind of happened over the last like few months the last month we have a timeline at least from our awareness of this as we uh, as Case tweeted on the account, we have been on this for about a month. I think that's fair to say. And I'm trying to think of what, what angle we should go first. Case, should we just go right to our timeline, and or should we start talking big picture first? Well, let, let, let's go to the timeline. So I, I guess I want to make our stance clear on this. You know, this is not something that I read in the Observer and then started talking to people about. This is something that Mike and I have been aware of since the beginning of May, that this is when we were given this information and we were not planning on talking about it until the company said something, but Dave put it in the observer. Dave actually put it in the observer like two or three weeks ago in the Lucha section and nobody caught it, but Dave put it in the observer and then Rob Viper tweeted out that they were booked for a riot Lucha show and that Kento and Fujiwara were now based in Mexico. And I saw a lot of people saying, no, they're just back in Japan getting their visas, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I, in a way, almost felt like I owed it to Dave, given that we came down so hard on him last year for some inaccurate Dragon Gate reporting. When I saw people start to pile on again, that's when I came to you and I said, I, you know, now was the time to say something because what Dave is saying is, is true with the information that we have. So I want to make it very clear that uh, this is a story we've been working on for over a month now, and we have confirmation from multiple parties on two different continents. We have people representing the Japan side of things and people representing the Mexico side of things that are both telling us the same thing, that these guys are gone. Now, I guess we can start by saying they're still listed on the Gaiora website, and it's safe to assume that because there hasn't been a public announcement that they are still under contract. But Mike, where do you see this uh, ending up before we get into the timeline and giving a little bit more information that people don't have yet. Yeah, uh, let me take the baton here for a second. So just to provide a little bit more reasoning on why, for at least Case and I, we both jointly decided that this was a overall topic and a report that we wanted to play rather, for lack of better terms, cautiously, because it's, it, that there are a lot of moving parts with this. Well, there's and international it, ramifications to it, too. I mean, it's a, it's a scoop that isn't a scoop with a Z. I mean, there's real impact possibly yeah. to this. And it is something that it is uh, it has ramifications. And I take I, I think everyone who has been following us or has been aware of Dragon Gate coverage over the last half of year, we the, this is not a story that the, that anything good happens if it breaks early and is wrong. Right. Like it's it, it's one of those things that at least for the very least, the way I looked at it, I was just as soon as the company had official word, as soon as something really came out officially from the company, that was re- really when I felt like we should all circle up and, you know, have a have a talk about this. But it, 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 one thing that I think before we get into the timeline and talk about like contract stuff that is pretty uh, important and if anyone's going to be like fast forward and scrubbing everyone that we have talked to and this is not just like hearing from one person or another this is multiple continents as case said different sides people within the lucha libre community community people within the overall wrestling community it's it's something that everyone has for lack of a better terms has come to an agreement about that this happened and part of the reason why I think, at least for me personally, I felt like we needed to be cautious about this uh, report and this uh, news item was the fact that there, with Dragon Gate and with Dragon System, these sort of uh, departures, 
I guess I'll go with part. These sort of departures have been going on basically since the, the company began in, in 1999. And they are often situations that are inherently very complicated. And Dragon Gate or whomever in power at times has done certain ways of, okay, this is how we're walking away from a situation. Like Aga Niso case was a firing that, or was a situation that took basically 15 years before an agreed truth was agreed to by all parties, right? And for those that don't know, Mike, what is that agreed truth? Oh, the agreed truth is that everyone was like, this is it's best for all parties to separate and walk yes. away. Yep. And storyline, they said it was a firing at the time up until 2019. That was as everyone assumed, but people came back together kind of 15 years later, 15 years older. And, you know, kind of take a step back and go like, you know what? We all really needed to get away from each other. So my that that's all to say that my expectation up until Friday was that we were going to not hear a single thing about SB Kento and Takuma Fujiwara until after Kobe World or a, some big show in the future of which maybe their contract was aligned with and then their profiles would have been quietly deleted from the GAOR website. That was my assumption of how this was going to play out. And it still very much might play out that way, that even after Dave's report in The Observer, after this podcast, Dragon Gate's more likely than not. I, I, I think it's fair to say that they might just wait till all the time and just delete them from the website. I mean, they're not on posters. They were not on the Kobe World po poster. It's something that the company has done before and is more than willing to do. Well, as I'll explain as I get into the to end of the timeline here, SB Kento and Takuma Fujiwara, by all accounts, have no desire, seemingly, no plans, I'll say, to work Drangate, and Drangate has no plans to use those guys going forward. So I will reference the Act of God insurance clause, which I don't know if, if you've ever heard of that, but you know, if you're on a concert outside, you normally have what's called an Act of God insurance clause that if like a weird weather-related event happens, you can normally get out of paying refunds. And I think we're in Act of God mode for this situation where everybody agrees that this is what's happening, and if something changes, a higher power will likely be involved. I think that's where we're at with this story right now. Yeah, that's actually kind of the way... I would treat this here, but I, I, I've rambled on too much. Let, let, let's go through the timeline. So May 1st, uh, you and I are alerted from what we'll refer to as the Japan side that SB Kento and Takuma Fujiwara are gone from the company over uh, what we'll describe as behavioral issues, company misconduct, uh, whatever you want to do. We will not get into the nitty gritty of why they appear to be let go from the company. That is a, a story that we will not be breaking. That is a story that if somebody else wants to step out there, we can certainly confirm or deny because it, you know, there's, there's a lot of layers there. And I think you and I have a pretty good idea of what happened, but certainly not confirmed and certainly something that we will not be reporting here, but you yeah. and I get the alert on uh, May 1st that they are gone from the company. Yeah. And I believe that whenever, if there's ever a public, thing unless they talk about whatever i'm just going to use blanket whatever i have case and i both jointly agreed we're not going to talk about these uh, getting into those details although i think it's fair to say that there is a general agreement about a behavioral issue case yes yeah, it's, it's I, not like a heinous crime no, you know no. to, to our not but it, there was there was misconduct involved that the company didn't want to associate with and that's why we find ourselves in this situation right and we're going to use phrase Japan side and Mexico side to kind of designate uh, who we are talking to and when there are multiple people who are part of these sides. It's not just one person, among it, but we're just going to use Japan and Mexico to describe it because that's the easiest way to do this and to also, in lack of better terms, protect the people we talk to. Yes. Yeah, so that was that was May 1st. That afternoon, I reached out to the Mexico side and asked for any sort of clarification on this. And they came back to me and said that they are, are for sure leaving and heading back to Mexico. I asked, and I quote, leaving Dragon Gate or just leaving Japan? And the Mexico side came back to me and said, quote, Dragon Gate for sure, unsure, unsure about Japan forever, but they wanted to go back to Mexico. That is followed yeah. up. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, we, uh, I, at this time, uh, the, it is of the 
our joint belief that these two guys have been out of Mexico for several months at this point and were in Japan. On May 3rd, uh, the Mexico side follows up with me, and they said, quote, I know they're gone. I don't know why they're fully gone yet. And then a message later in the day saying, quote, they won't be in Mexico under a sigh, meaning Ultimo Dragon. They are independent. So that is where we stand as of May 3rd. On May 5th, we get a note from the Japan side saying that they expect a major announcement after Dead or Alive pertaining to the situation. And listeners of this podcast will know that Mike and I did same-day audio of Dead or Alive, and I think it's relevant to the story. You and I had blocked out time in the day to watch Dead or Alive, review the show on audio, and then do breaking news audio later in that day because it seemed so certain that this story was going to break on May 5th. Right, and the Japan side was and since then has been very certain about that. And it was something that discussing with at least uh, in this case, it was something that it was, it appeared imminent from multiple parties. And yeah, it was something where, I mean, at that point it became kind of awkward for us because I was like, I, we need to, if this breaks, we need to have the show goes up, even though it's going to be on a weekend and that sometimes can be kind of difficult. So yeah, at this point, it's worth noting at this time that at least with this and the dead or alive timing, it was something that was happening around the time of the show. Yeah, so obviously dead or alive happens. That's May 5th and Madoka Kakuta, the Open the Dreamgate champion, closed out the show with the promo about the new big six generation. And it's him and it's Shun and it's Yoshioka and it's Ben K, and it's Strong Machine J, and it's Coach Minora. No reference of SB Kento, no reference of Takuma Fujiwara. I, certainly people in the Voices of Wrestling Discord, people on Dragon Gate Twitter, make note of that. Hey, is that a little strange? From a storyline perspective that they weren't, weren't mentioned at all, and Mike and I kind of bit our tongues for a month going, well, you know, I think there's, there's a reason that they weren't mentioned in that promo, because by this point, the ideology had already shifted to where they are, are done going forward. Yeah, and there was still enough of a veil, I think, purely in kayfabe. Purely in kayfabe to the fact that SB Kento and Takuma were not a part of the active roster at that time. Why would Kakuta lump them in and call them in the ring with her, but when everyone, kayfabe wise, expects them to be elsewhere in the world at that point? So in mid-May, I don't have hard dates for these, and these are things that I find to be very relevant to the story. Some people may roll their eyes or not find them to be, but I think this is part of the story that needs to be told here. Sometime in mid-May, SB Kento unfollows President Keto on Instagram. Now, SB Kento continues to follow the company itself and a handful of Dragon Gate wrestlers, but there was very clearly a severed tie or at least an active decision. President Keto still has an Instagram account. SB Kento still has an Instagram account. President Keto follows SB Kento. SB Kento was, but is no longer following President Keto. Yeah, and it's something that maybe it, it not to tangent here. It is something that, like, at least with how social media is, and with how the company was so devoted, was so like not necessarily anti-social media pre OWE split, but it was not necessarily a focus of that. But it is something that. Pretty quickly, I mean, one can go look at Royoya Tanaka's Twitter account. Immediately follows a set amount of people all affiliated with Dragon Gate. And there's some outside of that. It's kind of one of those things that's, a, it's a, I would say it's expected, you know, as like a public facing thing that you're following the company boss. Yeah, well, I mean, look at the way that this roster uses social media. They're not personal accounts by any means. And that's more of a cultural thing than just a Dragon Gate thing. But these are... These are guys that have a social media account for the company that they work for and to promote the company that they work for. And it's, you know, it's an active decision to unfollow somebody on a social media app. And that is certainly what SB Kento did. And as I scroll through here real quick on Tanaka's Twitter account, since you brought that up, I'm just curious now. He does not follow SB Kento or Takuma Fujiwara. So that is uh, obviously Nishikawa he follows. No uh, SB Kento, no Takuma Fujiwara. And to go along with that, it is unclear from what I was able to find if Takuma Fujiwara was ever following President Keto, but he is not currently doing that. And it is unclear if both SB Kento and Takuma Fujiwara were ever following the aforementioned Takuma Nishikawa or La Estrella, but both of them are currently not doing that. Right. Yeah, I think going forward, it'll be very interesting to see if Nishikawa 
ends up on the same shows as SB Kento and Fujiwara. I would assume not, but we will cross that bridge when we get there. Another quick social media note in late May slash early June. This might have been the first day of June that this happened. Takuma Fujiwara changes his Instagram handle. He was Takuma underscore F underscore 0204. He is now Takuma underscore Luchador on Instagram, which is certainly a change in direction of the way he's marketing himself. Yeah, and it's something that I when we were talking a little bit earlier, one thing I did not make clear we don't know when these contracts are expiring if this is going to be one of those put on ice situations at least in japan so it could it, these contracts could have expired june 1 yeah yeah very much so they also they, they could be up after kobe world we don't know now may 30th there's a note here i think this is really when it set in for both you and i that uh, this is not something that is to be taken lightly and that is a Drangate alumni publicly referred to SB Kento and Takuma Fujiwara as members of the Drangate roster in a now-deleted tweet. That person received a phone call from a high-ranking office person in Dragon Gate asking them to please not associate those two wrestlers with the company moving forward. Yeah, and it's something that is kind of remarkable. It was expressed to me by that person very clearly, very explicitly that that is not protocol and that it was extremely strange for them to receive a phone call, a phone call specifically from a native Japanese person. Uh, that's not normally how that sort of business is done between those two parties, but they got a phone call asking them very clearly, please do not refer to SP Kento and Takuma Fujiwara as members of the Dragon Gate roster going forward. And it, it's something worth noting. I, I know that we've kind of fast forward case that there was something that I was trying to look up that happened in the meantime. There was a triple A show during this that there was a it was a spot show that was announced that it was supposed to have SB Kento and Takuma Fujiwara there that at that time ended up being someone else. It was the news report ha still had them wrestling. It ended up being this is I'm actually going to be citing Cubs fan on this on this show. This was May 18th ended up being. Nishikawa and Nozaki there. So Nozaki from Kyushu Pro were there. So there, the, there was other stuff happening at this time, also involving SB Kento and Takuma inside of Mexico. And I don't know if that is something that pertains to the situation or if it's lucha incompetence. It's really hard for me to tell with that specific instance. Right. It's just important to know that there. It, this is something that other companies have. I don't know are necessarily clear about as well. Yes. So like I said, uh, on the Japan front, uh, they were explicitly asked to not refer to them as members of the company going forward. And then on June 2nd, after the observer report came out, somebody from Mexico reached out to me and said that they will actively be based in Mexico city and quote, they are definitely not there temporarily. They are actively looking for bookings and those bookings as of right now, big Lucha on June 17th, uh, with a chance if they win the tag team tournament to come back and wrestle there in July, the AAA tapings uh, on June 18th, and a Riot Lucha Libre show on July 22nd. And I think it's interesting to see the uh, the AAA taping will be a route for them that I would be, if you're looking for like a constant work thing, that's probably that. Uh, it, it, it's something where it does seem like that they that that the idea of either of them working in the states is not going to happen in the near future from my my understanding of the situation and then also issues that 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 has happened with visas and such well that's where we can sort of expand this to the big picture i i was uh, very surprised at some of the speculation that I saw that maybe these guys are NXT bound or SP Kento fell in love with the US Indies or maybe they're going to New Japan or NOAA and if it doesn't make sense to you, don't feel bad. It doesn't really make sense to me. But everything that we are hearing is that these guys just want to work in Mexico and that, you know, this is almost an elevated sense of what the company dealt with with Ata 10 years ago, where Ata was essentially forced kicking and screaming back on the plane to Japan because he didn't want to leave. SB Kento and Takuma Fujiwara have sort of one-upped him and said, well, we are not leaving. And by all accounts, their plan is to work Mexico and to try to get work in AAA. Conan is now a fan of them. Longtime listeners. This will be a little Easter egg for the people that have listened to this podcast for a while. 
when SP Kento first went to North America, we talked about a high level promoter who watched footage of these guys and said, nope, not impressed. And that was Conan. And since then, he is on record. I'm not telling uh, tales out of school here because he's on record as saying he didn't think much of Kento and Takuma when they first worked AAA. Now he is a fan of them. And it would seem as if they will be AAA wrestlers going forward. Yeah, and it's something that this news, at least Dave writing about this news, this news being published happened soon after Noah lost to lower card wrestlers i'm blanking on their names right now okay so it was okada and somebody else i'm i'm I already yano, forgot about that. I'm yes yeah i'm glad you mentioned that yeah okada and yano and i had it, it complete i think it's fair to say unless there's something utter i would say utterly bizarre that we do not know about completely unrelated there there's not any like indication of any sort of jump not even like in the way that shingo takagi in 2018 went freelance and then immediately went into new went over to new japan but he had like a couple weeks of freelance status that that's not what's going on here and that's at least the impression that i have is just that they are now just mexico based and i don't know if they're really i i have not checked around in particular that but case i at least i without getting into stuff we don't want to get into has there been any indication to you that this is something for the for these two guys to do any sort of a jump? To like, cause, because my reading of the situation is that it's just that they want to that, that that like the end and for them at least it seems to be for the near future is working Mexico. No, I, I I mean look they're they're behind the eight ball on New Japan because to my knowledge they don't have an end there. It seems like New Japan is not really interested in bringing in new wrestlers and. For as talented as they are, SP Kento is really small. I mean, he's five, a three. small, he's a small Dragon Gate wrestler. Yeah, he's five look, three. It, it, look, they have the talent to succeed in the, in the New Japan Junior Division, but I don't look at that as the the long term play here. Nor do I see it in Noah. Nor do I see it in DDT. I certainly don't see it in Gleed. I mean, look, that would make things very interesting and very weird. But I I would not be holding my breath uh, that that is the move here. These are guys that, by all accounts. They're young, they're good-looking, they like traveling the world. I talked to independent wrestlers when SB Kento was stationed in North America, and the you know the feedback I got was, hey, this guy's here for a good time. You know, even hey, Jay referenced it on the podcast, you know, when he was on about a month ago, and it was right before uh, this story broke. You know, Nishikawa is there, he's all business. He, he's a little bit older, and he seems to be able to handle that side of things a little bit better than SB Kento and Takuma Fujiwara did. I think they sense freedom in Mexico. I, I think they have a chance to uh, perhaps be the person that the culture in Japan would not allow them to be, and they have taken full advantage of it. You know, again, I yeah. don't think there's I don't think there's grandiose plans for a jump here. And, it, and if you're sitting there listening and thinking, that's really ill-advised to just think these guys, you know— I, blue chip prospects guys who were pushed sb kento multiple time champion in dragon gate that they're just gonna you know work triple a and work big lucha and you know maybe they pop up on a monterey show here and a tijuana show here i, I would agree it seems extremely ill-advised but the impression that we get is that they are sort of hell-bent on doing so yeah and i think w that it really w one thing about this overall situation that Really, if you reach this far, I really hope you take something, take this from there. When you look at, like, their ages, essentially, you, you look at the fact that Takuma Fujiwara might have just turned 21, might have, yes. and SB Kento is 23, maybe 24, the, the, they're at an age in their life where, you know, you do these sorts of things. You know, like, it's it it it, it, it is something that, case i just because of being so involved in like trying to talk to people with this i've been on my phone a lot over the last month and my girlfriend's been like what's going on with this and kind of in in terms of someone who does not care about wrestling one <laughs> so, so honey tori casa start there <laughs> yeah 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 I, I i i laid out 
the particulars to it. And so the New Japan Dojo had size requirements in the eighties. <laughs> so a man named Yoshinari size. So let's start there, honey. Sit down, but, but, grab uh, a bite to eat. I'm going to be here for a while. This, uh, we need to talk about this guy named Grand Hamada. <laughs> but, but, but but essentially, like after explaining the situation and some uh, of it, she looked at me and she was like, "Mike, sounds like college kids making college kids decisions." Yes, yeah, very much so. So so that's something I really hope to impart with like this discussion about all of this is it it, it seems like a lot of this is that kind of stuff yeah you yeah. know when it but when it's boiled down to it at least like action wise it, it'll be very interesting to see where we're at a year from now because w- when the story the story first started to break and i was talking to people mainly on the mexico side i, I was almost in disbelief of just like they can't they can't disassociate with these two kids think about who they are and the the message from the drangate alumni of you know i i got this phone call it really put into perspective this is a, a very serious situation on both sides and we'll see what comes of it it's obviously very unfortunate because it's it's sp kento who from his very first match in the company i said i think drangate has found their next yamato and when he and fujiwara were stationed in mexico and this was before we knew the exact status of Fujiwara's visa. We weren't sure if he was going to be able to work America or not. You know, I would talk to people involved in independent wrestling and they would go, well, I, I kind of know Kento, like he's pretty good, right? I was like, yeah, he's pretty good. But they're like, but I don't really know anything about this Fujiwara kid. And I would go, okay, so you know how good SP Kento is? Takuma Fujiwara is even better. And to lose two kids like that is, is a major loss to the company, even at their age and their experience level. Yeah, and it, it it's also something that if you look at at least in SB Kento's position since uh, December 2019, if you want to look at wrestling cards and being on wrestling cards as resources, finite resources, because Dragon Gate case, as we both know, six or seven matches on the show probably combined 25 wrestlers per show. That th- that's pretty fair, right? Yeah. Since December 2019, Dragon Gate has been investing that much of a resource at a level that case we have been keeping track in real time, uh, broke the mold, broke expectations. Like there was such an investment into result in that phone call tells you a whole lot and tells you a lot of the position, at least what it appears to be the position of Dragon Gate about the situation without them publicly doing anything, which I, which again, they could just as easily release something or not. Yeah, very much so. So, you know, it's a situation that, like we said at the top, we have people on two different continents that are invested in the situation for different reasons, telling us the same thing. We have people extraordinarily close to the situation reporting to us, going, this is what's going on. If something changes, this podcast will obviously update you. If there is a public statement from the company, this podcast will be the first to talk about it. We will know more than anybody else. But as of right now, on on June 6th recording date at 7.39 p.m. Central Standard Time, this is where things stand. You know, are are they technically, officially still with the company? Yes, but I, I use the verbiage in my tweet very specifically. They are no longer affiliated with dragon gate it seems like both of these parties are at a standstill and neither really want anything to do with one another so we will see where this goes going forward but you and i had enough information privately when the, that when this story started to bubble up and bubble up in a in a public discourse sort of way uh, we feel very comfortable saying that this is the situation that's occurring uh, as of the information we have right now yeah and uh, again there's confidence in us it, it, it's basically something that at this point everyone has agreed that we've talked to that there is like a timeline that all parties agree to essentially it's just that dragon gate operates in dragon gate kind of ways (laughs) for lack of better words case like i fully expect in july to pull up the gayora website and just suddenly one day to see those profiles go away and if not like that just keep the image caches and these two guys just no longer exist essentially We'll see what happens. You know, it, it's uh, it's an interesting time. The, the the big discourse that I saw out of this, outside of you know, are they going to make a jump? Are they going to New Japan? Are they going to NXT? Which again, I don't think they're going to NXT because, to my knowledge, Takuma 
doesn't have papers to work on America, but but you know we'll, we'll certainly see. I, I I would say that's probably the the least likely of the scenarios that I've heard. I would say it's more likely they're back in Drangate than in NXT. But it brought up the discussion of God, Drangate just keeps on losing these wrestlers. You know, for so long they were this tight knit group. Everybody stayed together, and now they're not that. And I I don't know if that's entirely true. Well, what are your thoughts on? historically sort of Dragon Gate's loss prevention versus losing wrestlers. I think that it is something that the dojo always kind of always has had next up, even during like the driest of the dry times, uh, especially like thinking about post millennials, like all of this, like there, there's always been an aspect of it, but I think that, at times there's not a lot of an understanding about how Dragon Gate trains and just like the idea of this dojo exists to train wrestlers. Not everyone is going to want to stay in Dragon Gate. Like that happens a lot. That happens more often than not. But uh, I'm right now looking at our, our notes here case and the, the the fascinating thing about what we're going to get into is that this the, this list does not even include people who went to wrestling after leaving Torimon, failing out and passing protests elsewhere. Like it's a it's something that it, it's always looked like it, but I mean when you look at a roster that has basically for twenty five years been self sustained, I don't think that I think that this churn is kind of natural and expected, and the fact that you would have the exact same people 25 years later would actually be somewhat creepy. Well, I, you know, we have stressed because I think you and I specifically being where we are and, and for how long we have been watching Dragon Gate, I think you and I were both burnt by 2015 and 2016, you know, the Ishida in Yamamura era into Ben and Shun and Yuki Yoshioka and the guys that didn't work, which were El Lindemann and Ishida and Yamamura and Katsumi Takashima, where, you know, the audio that exists, whether it's it's prior incarnations of this podcast or maybe the Voices of Wrestling flagship podcast, where you listen to a show from late 2016, early 2017, and you go, oh my God, they have so many young guys, they're set for the next 10 years. And then you listen to a show from early 2018, and you go, they have no no young guys, they have no depth. I, we have stressed ever since that moment, you know, they have these loaded rookie classes. They have a, a better stock dojo than any company in Japan. Not all of them are going to make it. Now, I certainly was not expecting to ever be a, in this position where we're referring to SB Kento and Takuma Fujiwara in that situation. That comes as a surprise because I had picked those guys as future Kobe World main eventers, specifically against one another, but not all of these guys are going to make it. And I think because Drangate throughout the years has actually had so many people graduate from their dojo that people lose sight of the churn and burn, the turnover that has taken place on this roster. And so I kind of I kind of want to go through that real quick just to you know may, look, maybe I'm too close to the sun on this one. Maybe I'm just not seeing what other people are seeing, but I just I, I'm kind of convinced that's a false narrative that Nobody ever left this promotion until Shima left, and then the dominoes started to fall, and Dragon Gate's in trouble, and Stardom's on the rise, and we're going to do this whole thing again. And I just don't think historically that's true, and you you don't have to look too far deep into the history of the promotion. Look at the T2P class. Beloved, revered, historically significant T2P class. They debut in November 2001 in Japan, November 13, 2001, first T2P show. By 2005, February of 2005, these names that graduated from the T2P class are no longer on the roster. Alano Collection AT, Shuji Kondo, Brother Yashi, Shogo Takagi, Sugawara, Awashi, uh, uh, Kenya, uh, Philip J. Fukumasa, Yoon, Kawabata, and uh, and then later you, you, you lose guys like Raimu Mishima, and you lose guys like Taku Uwasa, and you lose guys like Anthony W. Mori, even if he's still with the company. The T2P class was survived by Masato Yoshino, Naruki Doi, Sachi Hoko Boy, and Referee Yagi. By 2005, essentially, those are the guys that are left. That right there is like 80% turnover in that class just by the time we're a year into Dragon Gate. 
Yeah, and it's something that just continues, okay? So I'll, I, I'll pick up from here, pick up from you here when you yeah, look please. at Torimon X. Torimon X was rushed to it. We've talked about Torimon X a lot. It basically was rushed because of uh, the split was happening and you, you Ultimo needed to remain having a footprint. And the only people who remained around Dragon Gate in any serious capacity off and on since 2004 have been Kagatora and Naoki Tanizaki, who who has left and come back and left to come back and is now out again. So it's really Kagatora. Yeah, I mean Tanizaki's almost been gone a decade at this point. And, and it breaks my heart, but you know it's it's true. And it continues when you get to the Trueborns. You you look at now we are in a world where Shingo Takagi graduated out. You you go number two, you still have BB Hulk. Then it was Akira Tozawa. He is gone. Yuki Ono. He is gone. Uh, the, then you're able to go over to Yamato. He's still there. Then there is also uh, Katsuo. Yuki Ono gone. Lupin Matsutani was there for a brief period of time. Koji Shishido, another person that kind of had a wrestling role a lot longer than he was actively in ring as himself. He was better known as Jackson, Florida for a lot of time, but he was another office worker. And that's just from the initial people going up into the next class. Yeah, and for, and from there you have that sixth era sort of guys and the Yohei and the Kenshin Chicano. And I, I think, uh, you know, w- without accusing anybody of horrific animal abuse, let me make that very clear. That's not the situation here. I, I think we're looking at a, a period very similar to that first gen uh, Torima, or I'm sorry, that first gen Drangate class into that sixth era where, you know, you're still going to have your Ishins and you're still going to have your Manoritas and your other guys from the future class that survived, but you lose a Yohei and you lose a Chin, uh, Kenshin Chicano and a Lupin Matsutani, even if he wasn't the most talented, it all of a sudden eats into your depth. But are those guys necessarily relevant to the promotion at large? I, I, I don't think so. And I think that's what I'm trying to get at as we get further along in this timeline is like, have they lost some bodies? Yes. Are, are they the most relevant bodies? No. Yeah, and it's one of those things that within Dragon Gate, I just have always had a, like a suspicion that this time period, like years ago, like, like a case at the beginning of COVID, I remember I was talking about this. I was like, well, this is the time where they need to get ready for like generations and figuring out stuff. And then this churn, this, this turnover is just something that has always existed and it just has kind of reared its head in weird fashions uh, for lack of better words. Yeah. So I, I I'm with you there. And then as we move along in the timeline, you know, we have the OWE split in 2018, which was catastrophic and it, it negatively impacted the company. Obviously I think Drangate has, has persisted in a far better way than certainly I thought. I think a lot of people thought, uh, I think even if 2018 and parts of 2019, it seemed like, man, that Shima, he is, he is one smart motherfucker. I think the tide has turned, and I think people now realize that Drangate is on a much more stable base than whatever Shima is associated with. But you lose Shima, and you lose T Hawk, and you lose Lindemann, and you use and you lose Yamamura. And even if Yamamura was out injured at the time, still losing losing Al Lindemann as a prospect was a very big deal. Now for T Hawk, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to him. And and losing Shima as a figurehead, even if it ultimately helped the promotion in the long run, short term, it was a drastic change, and people don't like change. And especially a figure like Shima, like as much as we can say, yeah, turnover happens. Uh, when you look at like the top line figures who have left the promotion over the years, it was a while between someone catastrophic. Like you had Akira Tozawa in 2016, but they, but that's still someone that as Akira Tozawa was one of his biggest fans, that's not the importance of a Shima to the promotion. And that was uniquely limiting but i think that we can now say five years after the fact a lot of the positive changes with dragon gate as we look and see glate versus dragon gate like we see that probably at least if you're looking at it purely from a dragon gate perspective things worked out all right in the end it just took a while to get to that end and i don't know if maybe that's it it's just you know 2014 through 2016 
was largely just a time where Drangeek took in wrestlers and didn't really let go of anybody. And because in the English speaking world, that is the the hottest period of Drangeek fandom, uh, maybe people just don't they don't look ahead and they don't look back. They just locked into that time frame. But as you can see, historically, there's always been turnover and Granted, you know, as we look at the post OWE departures, there was Katsumi Takashima and there was Oji Shiba. And then last year there was Kaito Ishida. And then now there's Sora Fujikawa and Riki Hashi and Shoya Sato on top of the veterans, you know, Gamma, Super Shisa, and Kness. But one, I think you have to look at why some of these guys left. You know, Katsumi Takashima, injured. Oji Shiba, Injured, left wrestling, came back, and is now an undercard wrestler for All Japan, which is awesome. Good for him, but not anybody of consequence. Not somebody that was going to headline a Cork and Hall, let alone a big show. You go down the list. Sora Fujikawa was a phenomenal prospect who got kicked in the face by Masaki Mochizuki, and it ended his career in an instant. All right? That kick goes one inch lower, two inches lower. He's still wrestling. He's still with the company. It was a freak accident. He never recovered from it. He lost his drive from wrestling as a result. Sora Fujikawa leaves the company. Ricky Hashi, by all counts, all accounts, kind of a weird dude. Has bounced around a lot of different professions. By the way, was at a Dragon Gate show recently, but is way more into bodybuilding with his father now. So it's a shame that he didn't stick around because there was such tremendous potential with both of the Ihashi brothers. And I liked Ricky more than Ishin, even if I quite like Ishin. But Ricky Ihashi, I, I'm not sure he's going to be a bodybuilder for the rest of his life. He is one of those guys, and we all know somebody like this, that is going to go from job to job to job. And it's not an A, B, and C. He's going to hop from profession to profession to profession with no thread in between. He's just going to be one of those guys, it seems like, that is always doing something new. So he leaves the company. You have a guy like Shoya Sato, who it was a miracle that he debuted in the first place. He is family. He is still associated with the company, no longer an active wrestler. And then again, it's like Gamma and Shisa and Kness. And if you watch Drangate at all post OWE split, I, I don't want to say who gives a shit because I respect the hell out of those guys. And, and they had their day where they were great. But, you know, Drangate kept chugging along after after they left or retired. It It was OK. You know, the relevant losses to me. And this is sort of the big picture thought here. The relevant losses to me since the OWE split are SB Kento, Takuma Fujiwara, maybe Kazuma Sakamoto, but he was always a freelancer. It was a, a ticking time bomb with him. And then Kaito Ishida. And I think Ishida, I mean, look, I don't know. I don't understand that man's thought process at all. But I would hope that logical people realize that Ishida was in a much better position his last year in Dragon Gate than he currently is as a former Gleet champion who's now, I guess, like an all Japan tag team wrestler. Uh, you know, that's that's what his life is. Now. Hey, hey, he's teaming of Harley Jackson. OK, Oh, thank God. Yeah, no. It, it, and it's something that I'm looking at the same list here. And it's notable that there, there's one name that hasn't even really popped up as a departure. And that's Keisuke Akuda. Oh, my God. I, compl oh, I completely <laughs> forgot about him. I mean, look, I mean, Akuda was fired and hey, anybody that watched Akuda after 2020, because, I mean, look, nobody was higher on Akuda than this podcast was. Kaito Ishida versus Kaisuke Akuda fucking kicked ass. There's no other way to describe it. We love that feud. We talked about making a comp DVD for that feud. We were so invested in it. It, it was hockey fights wrestling. It was hockey fights wrestling, and it, and it was awesome, and we liked it. Everything after that sucked. He almost tanked Ben K's career. I will reference this all the time. There was a, a Kobe show last summer. I think it was probably last spring because he was gone by the summer where at the intermission, there was a meet and greet photo shoot with Ben K and Kaisuke Akuda. And the person that I talked to that attended that, sh that show said, I have never seen a smaller line for one of these in my entire uh, life of going to Dragon Gate shows. A few months later, right when Ben first gets into gold class, he goes, this place is a madhouse to do the chicky chicky with Ben K. They can't line up fast enough to meet this man to get their photo with him. Okuda was a blight on the company, a barnacle, if you will. If that is what you're concerned about in terms of roster turnover, the company is only better off no longer having Kaisuke Okuda on the roster. And we loved him for a short time. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it. that was more just our mark about how irrelevant he ended up being in the long run. Yeah, but, I, mean, I, I forgot to put him on the list. 
Yeah, it, it, exactly. And I, I think one of those things, at least for like the recent young wrestler turnover, that again, similar to uh, Kento and Takuma, is you look at uh, uh, Ricky Hashi mid 20s, uh, you look at Sora Fuchikawa mid 20s, I think uh, the same with Tats- Katsumi Takashima. And then you have Shoya Sato, who was, I think, has turned 30. So you're, you're, you're looking at this, and for at least, for a lot of these guys, it, it's at a time where you're trying to figure out your life in a lot of different ways. And, and at least for some of the people, like mentioned here, w- w- when talking to people about their departure, it was like, yeah, they, you know, they, 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 did, they decided they gave it a shot, and now they want to move on with their life. And Ricky Hashi's case, before he's all said and done, he might end up being like a crystal healer. Who knows? I, yeah, he's, that, that's he's, my he's version a bizarre of that guy. Man. He that's, is. <laughs> I, I, I mean, when I saw his bodybuilding photos and he was like rocking cornrows, I was like, all right, I, I, I just, I'm not going to try to predict anything of this guy anymore in the future. And, and I, I want to be clear. My point is not that this is not a big deal. Losing Kento and Fujiwara possibly is a gigantic deal. You know, uh, SB the Kento. Biggest- I, I, I would say Go guys, this is the, the biggest departures out of the last 24 months. If you want to talk really big, deep stakes. Oh, my God. I mean, it, it matters so much more than Ashita leaving. It matters so much more than Ruki Doi going freelance. It matters more than Ata going freelance, frankly, to the company that with the amount of time invested, at least in Kento like this. This is one that matters a whole lot more than anything else we've talked about over the last few years in this regard. Yeah, so you know, Kento like I I mean he was a he was a draw, he headlined dead or alive. He he mattered in Nagoya, his hometown, and as I as I will always continue to point out, of all of the markets in Japan, you know, New Japan is far and away the front runner in every market. And in Nagoya, it's kind of a New Japan one A Dragon Gate one B. You know, Dragon Gate that that has become their spot. It's where Ultimo's from. It's where Dragon Kid's from. It's where SB Kento's from. And they sort of had a three headed dragon there that they lose. Now it's just back to you know what big match can Dragon Kid lose at Dead or Alive? I think that's where we'll go back to going forward. But this is this is a massive deal. But we also have to put in perspective the the losses that they've suffered you know what did i say about kaito ishida last year i said this will matter more in the short term than in the long term by august when madoka kakuta stepped up to the plate it's like okay all right we found our kaito ishida placement we're good you know he he can go draw 500 fans in osaka for one gleet house and then you know six months later i i can barely find it with a search party you know again he's working all japan undercards congratulations I, i just think we have to put in perspective one this idea that yes, a lot of wrestlers have left the company over the last two years. How many of them matter? And two, we also can't act like this is unprecedented. There's history on our side that says, no, there's actually, this is a promotion that suffered a lot of turnover. They just had two or three years there where the veterans were old, but not old enough to where they needed to be pushed out. And they had young guys, but not too many young guys to where, you know, the young guys had to still wrestle. They couldn't suffer any any losses in that department or else their depth would have been screwed. It was a perfect storm. It worked out. Business was on fire. It makes sense, but let's not act like for 25 years, this has been a company of peace and harmony. Yeah, uh, it, it was something that I was like, w- when this broke, a lot of people in my DMs going like, Mike, what do you know about this? And I would just say, listen to the show Tuesday night or Wednesday. And if they they pride more, it's like, it's Dragon Gate. What do you expect? Yeah, this this stuff happens. It, it's unfortunate. Again, we'll we'll uh, we'll see what comes of this. I don't know if if we'll get more news coming out of this podcast, either privately or if, you know, public statements are made, but. All signs point to right now uh, that uh, SP Kento and Takuma Fujiwara, as we know it, are gone from Dragon Gate. And if you're trying to follow them, uh, Mas Lucha is going to, and AAA is going to be the way to keep up. We'll keep up with them on the show. And as you said, if there's more news that comes out from this going forward, we can go, we will revisit this topic, I am sure. Today's podcast is brought to you by the Bet Stamp app, which is helping thousands of people win at sports betting for free. The same way travelers use Google Flights or Expedia to find the best prices, bettors can now use Bet Stamp to do the same. When you place a bet, the odds given by a sportsbook will determine how much you can possibly win. Even when betting on the same outcome, 
Different sports books will offer varying payouts, and these differences could be huge. Thankfully, BetStamp allows you to easily line shop for the most profitable odds across all sports books. You can click on any matchup and instantly see all the different odds for game lines, player props, and even futures bets. Line shopping is the simplest way to find an edge in sports betting and maximize your chances to win long term. On average, BetStamp users win an extra $1,000 plus yearly just by line shopping. You can find the BetStamp app on Apple iOS, Google Play Store, or through your browser at betstamp.app. To access all these benefits, sign up using promo code VOW and start your journey to successful sports betting today. If you forget to use the code upon sign up, you can always enter our code in your BetStamp account settings afterwards. Check it out. This was such a big week for Dragon Gate and Ring. We had a double header in Tokyo that we'll be talking about the first and second. The uh, the episode on the first will be up for free into perpetuity, it seems like, and we'll we'll touch on the Kobe Sambo Hall show as well. And it taking a look at the attendance, nine twenty eight for Tokyo. It is something that uh, the I do not know the exact name of the typhoon, but there was weather in the air severe enough weather in the area over the two days that have blighted the attendance we i was as we were like leading up to it and the more as the cards came out i'm not necessarily surprised that attendance was this way and very remarkable to see on this at least this first show that the rare appearance of the dragon gate uh video screen happening but 928 uh bad weather there were concerts going on Case, what was your overall impression? I mean, they, they ended up being 2,000 over the two nights, but it seemed like it was something that you can't really... I, I, I don't take anything negative out of the attendance in Tokyo. Do you? I don't know. I'm weird. I always I always look at anything under 1,000, even if it's 985, let's say, or 928 like they did. It's like, yeah, it's you know, not a great number. Um, I, this, is, this is the ballpark that they live in right now. Um, I, I'm a little surprised... Just given the reaction some of these guys get, that they're not consistently in that 1,200 to 1,300 range, but rather the 1,000 to 1,100 range. So I, I think what we're seeing right now is there, there's been some, you know, quite frankly, some weak-ass cards on paper. And we saw that in Hokkaido, and those shows did not draw great. I didn't think the Osaka show looked all that good, but that did a great number in Osaka number two. And you look at this first Cork and show, and look, I was very into the last two matches of Shoot and Strong Machine J and then D-Courage versus uh, Doi, Dragon Kid, and Yamato. And I even asked you last week if this show had a shot of outdrawing night number two. You were correct. You said no way. But uh, this was not a show that looked like I could sink my teeth into it uh, on paper and in execution, certainly not the case. Yeah, my big picture takeaway, at least from night one, was that a lot of the things that happened that were really notable on night one really were to service up for night two and for things for Kobe world, which I was happy to see, but then you end up with not necessarily the most, uh, the, the most invigorating uh, undercard. I mean, to the fact that like the uh, match four here, there was actually a little bit of kind of a, cute uh count out tease and that was like the only notable thing on the undercard <laughs> really yeah this this was a a undercard full of wrestlers that i would like to not see on on cork and hall shows but the good news coming out of this you know i talked about H hokkaido it didn't seem like there were really a ton of angles there osaka yes we set the kobe world main event but it didn't seem like there was a lot of movement towards kobe world between these two Cork and shows and the Kobe Sambo Hall show, we have plenty of announcements and plenty of angles that we need to break down. Yeah, so I'm just going to go through results first, Case, and yes, then we'll please. get into the big things. All right, we opened with Kota Minora teaming with Minorita, going up against Eita and La Estrella. Minora won with a jumping knee. Notable in this match and on this show, uh, President Nagamori, the Lek Corporation, was front row center and was landed on like twice by but in this match alone like it was just i, I love that i love that he sits front row I, that, he that loves is, it that is such a non elitist move you know he could be up in the balcony he could have that vip access this man is front row taking dives like a young boy i think that is so great and 
in a typhoon, a lot of people might have had a ticket to the show and did not attend. President Nagamori front and center there for the opening match. You love to see it. Match two, Natural Vibes, Jason Lee, UT, and Jackie Funky Kame versus Ginky Horiguchi, Sachi Oko Boy, and Kagatora. Jason Lee pens Sachi with the maximum driver. Match three was an eight-man tag. Zebrats, Diamante, Kai Hyo, and Ishin versus Don Fuji, Punch Tomonaga, and the returning Ryu Fuda and Daiki Yanagiuchi. It was Ishin quick with his swinging scrap buster. Match four, M2K, Masaki Mochizuki, Susumu Mochizuki, Azushi Kondo versus Suji Kondo, Takashi Yoshida, and Problem Dragon. It was ruled a count out. Yazu, uh, Shuji Kondo, this was a preview of the next night's main event. He tried to get Problem Dragon back in the ring to break out the double ring out. It was not so fast. Match five, KZ and Big Boss Shimizu lose to Binkei and BB Hulk building up what we will talk about after the uh, night two main event. The special singles match, Shun Skywalker versus Strong Machine J. Shun Skywalker won with two moonsault knees. Refusing to do the SSW there. And then the main event, D Courage, Madoka Kakuda, Yuki Yoshioka, and Dragon Daya fall in defeat to Yamato, Dragon Kid, and Uruki Doi. Yamato pins Dragon Daya after two Galareas. But it was not really these matches that were the big stories to talk about on this first cork. And but case, it's been a kind of a. It, it was kind of a tale of two cards, as we were saying, like the semifinal main event, excellent stuff, but there, everything else on the lower card, I had a whole bunch of like three stars and move on matches. It was a tough review to write, quite honestly. I mean, I have my written review over at Voices of Wrestling dot com with in-depth, in-depth thoughts on every match. But this was kind of one of those shows where you just weren't given a lot to work with until the final two matches. And I'll, I'll save most of my Shun versus strong machine J thoughts for later. All you really need to know right now is that uh, that is a few that is clicking for me on all cylinders. I, I love the chemistry. Those two have, I love the work they're doing in the ring. I love the story they're telling with those two. I was into that. And then there was the main event and the main event left me a little befuddled. I, I was, I was quite conflicted over the result of this main event. And I want to know, where you're at here, because a month ago, Madoka Kakucha stood in the ring, and he said, I am a part of the generation that now matters. It's me, and it's Yoshioka, and like I said, you know, Minora, Ben Keishu, and Strong Machine J. And I'm thinking, okay, all right, very cool. They've got a main event that has Kakucha and Yoshioka heading into headlining Kobe World, and they're against the established guys, you know, Doi, Dragon Kid, and, Kaku- and, uh, and Yamato. Surely Dragon Kid is taking the pinfall here. And instead, what we get is Yamato pinning Dragon Daya. And to me, that felt like a one step forward, two steps back sort of deal where we want it to be Kakuta and Yoshioka's company. We want it to be Shun and Strong Machine J's company. We want Gold Class to feel like they matter. But nobody matters more than Yamato. And I I don't know what it is. That just bugged me. Where are you at with this? I think that taken in a void... It is kind of annoying. I'm not as perturbed as you are. I, I've been saying for a long time, the problem with decourage is that you're going to have someone takes falls. And this is what the issue is, is because Dragon Daya, because they don't have a loss post and they were running with small units right now, he's going to have to eat falls here. Like there was, it was something that, yeah, ideal world, you, you figure Dragon Kid would win. But with what happened immediately right after, they had to service into keeping Yamato looking strong. Is it one step forward, two steps back? I think a little bit, but I I think that this result also hinged on what was announced right after as well. And Daya is the only person that... The, I mean, look, Kakuta's not getting pinned as champion. Yoshioka's number one contender. He's not getting pinned. Daya, sorry. it's just, it, it sucks. I mean, D Courage should have a fall post. They definitely should because you get scenarios like this. The, the, and this was not the case when you had units that had four or five people in it. I I am just of the belief Yamato versus Hiromu is a match that can live and gain the necessary hype. Yamato certainly shouldn't take the pinfall, but he also doesn't have to pin anybody. Have him take a clothesline, have him roll to the outside, and let's have D-Courage pin Dragon Kid and let's move on with our lives. It just, it, it to me, it sent the wrong message about Uh, confidence in the new generation. And that's something that we'll certainly cross in just a second as well. When we talk about other matches on Kobe world of like, 
wait, wait, I, I thought Kakuta was the guy. He seemed like the guy. And now it seems like you're telling me he's not the guy. Yamato versus Hiromu will live whether or not Yamato pins Dragon Die in this situation. It didn't bother me. I still went four stars in the match. I thought the final few minutes were just breathtaking. They all they were working so fast and so crisp. It is just that that Dragon Gate difference. You know, the thing that takes a six man tag and it, from good to great. They hit greatness in those last few minutes. I just I, I Yamato doesn't need any more wins. We know who Yamato is. D Courage, despite I think being healthy, still needs all the help they can get. And and you say like it was a Dragon Gate difference. I think it was the Dragon Dia difference. Like we talk about him getting pinned in this matchup, but across the weekend, I would say maybe not most valuable wrestler. I feel like that there's one special man who gets that distinction for his performance the next night alone. But he is the final stretch of Yamato, exceptional. Dia taking a beating whenever needed to be with that with how this unit's constructed it's basically lives or dies on how great of a crowd connection dragon dia has and yeah it's an easy four-star match it is something though did, did do you have a any sort of uh decourage exhaustion or decourage needs to have different matchups and this kind of was feeling like a matchup we would have seen last summer no, I went notebook on the two D Courage six mans this weekend, and I went three and three quarters on the D Courage versus D Courage matchup. I, I'm, I, I'm not feeling burnt out there. It, it, it's something I like to just test the water every once in a while. I feel like I've brought this up before that, like sometimes the the combinations, if that's leading to any sort of staleness, I'm not necessarily feeling that at this time. Did I like the fact that in this matchup you had you you, you had Doyama back at it and. Yamato spent like the first like five minutes fueling Doi's insecurities about being less over than D Courage. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, a lot of play there. Yep. And of course, as we've mentioned in the post match, uh, GM Rio Saito and President Nagamori of the La Corporation get in the ring to show us a special video. This is not the first video. We'll talk about the second video that happened earlier on the show, but it is a announcement from Hiromu Takahashi that. At Kobe World, July 2nd, he will be facing Yamato. Yamato was a little perplexed. He thought it was was a challenge, but no, this match was already set. And we have the major special singles match happening at Kobe World. We were wondering about the outsider. We were we knew that there was going to be some sponge money brought about here. We thought it might be a different member of LIJ, though, as Hiromu, after the... Uh, the storyline between him and Yamato that's basically existed on a New Japan show on social media, well, it's happening at Kobe World. Yeah, that that is where, uh, I, you know, I really work hard uh, to not be a gatekeeper. I don't often have that bone in me because I really, I, I want this to be as inclusive as possible. I will get annoyed when people will later describe this match as, oh, it's a dream match. It doesn't need a build. You know, it's just happening because it's a cool match there's a build to this match. It, it goes back to the all-star junior festival where Yamato on Twitter was working an angle saying that he was annoyed when the big companies only use smaller groups like dragon gate, at least, you know, in terms of publication size and the press they get when they need to draw a house or have a cool match or have a special feature. And then of course he ended up on the all-star junior festival. And that was, you know, really the draw of that show was the six-man tag with Yamato and Hiromu in and on opposing sides. This is a continuation of that. This is, uh, look, it doesn't have to be Flair versus Funk, but there's absolutely a story involved to this singles match. And we might get to see Cranky Yamato, which is exciting with this. Yeah, very because, much so. Because at the All-Star Junior Festival, it was not the almighty, all-knowing Yamato that we've seen, Ace of Dragon Gate. It was uh, the... The tired Yamato, the the Yamato who is a little self indulgent, the one that is kind of cranky to be there, and and I really hope that's kind of what we see. Like I think that you, know, I know like right now New Japan's doing like Rhodes shows. Like Yamato should should get involved on that. Like I want to see him invade. Oh my god, he'd be. It I won't mean, happen. No, it won't happen. But Yamato anywhere else for like six months. Oh my god, it'd be incredible. Yeah, just like he 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 can be like the sixth guy. Be just six guys. Yeah, <laughs> he'd be better are, looking than any of the, the good looking guys or any of the guys that are just five guys. I uh, Are you to tell me that Yamato would not thrive in a group that just is heavily drinking all the time? No, it, the, a bunch of handsome dudes that get drunk. That's that's who he is. That's his character. They stole that from him. 
yeah so it as we were kind of in the last few weeks trying to figure out like the important pieces of kobe world now we have perhaps like one of the big question mark pieces off the table and i know that this is obviously a match that's happening uh, partially because of outside money but i have to ask you case do you feel like that this is something that you're satisfied with with kobe world with yamato versus Hiromu being a match with, with particularly it being set up this way and that now this is what Yamato is doing at Dragon Gate's biggest show of the year. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, my God, yeah. It's better than him just in a random twin game match. I mean, this is awesome. The Yamato versus Hiromu, sign me up. Yeah, it, it's something that as we're going to keep on going down in this episode, I find myself, like, by the end of the Kobe show, I'm ready for Kobe World. Dude, this like, card is incredible. This is what I This is what I want to talk about this week was how the, we'll we'll get the final cards after Fukuoka so uh, a week from now we should know what the Kobe World cards are what we have looks fucking insane yeah just the six matches announced and yes that does leave like pieces that there's going to be a lot of get everyone on the card here but these six matches that we'll get into first off we, we already knew about Kakuda and Yoshioka for Dreamgate now we have Yamato and Hiromu and that alone I was looking at the attendance for Kobe World this year, case, and it is fascinating how the attitudes have changed this year with the show, with how only so? one show. Because you looked at it last year and in 2020, I feel like that because you had two nights, they made sure there were title matches. Like I like the idea that you have to defend your title twice to get out of the weekend. I thought that was kind of a smart way to fill out the cards, even if it meant that some of the builds were not that strong, but instead of have but a lot of those undercards for the last few years have been like so outside the title matches and like you know santo coming in for a match that we knew was going to be bad and then the yoshino retirement match which blew away expectations of what yoshino could do there it got kind of thin here this feels really stacked i'm really excited to see i'm i, I i'm curious to see how this will do uh ticket sales wise because this is something where they are putting their strongest foot forward and maybe aren't relying on Kakuda in the way that we were expecting. No, I mean, you look, Hiromu's on the show. You would certainly hope for a healthy bump with him. And then you're in a situation where, you know, you have these really strong title matches. You have this cage match. And you also have Kano. You have Eita. You have Mochizuki. These guys don't have matches on the show yet. And we would assume they'll be involved in an important way. If only... Maybe we can get a a, a Biu then uh, offer match on one of the uh, as like match zero Biu then maybe that's how we can get Sawa on a Kobe World show. I would I would hope they can find a way to do Mochizuki Kano and Eita in the same match. I don't know how they would do that. I don't know how what it would look like, but that'd be kind of fun. Oh, absolutely. Do you have any other uh, big picture thoughts? I know that your reviews of both these are up on VoicesOfWrestling.com, but anything else you wanted to touch on before we look at next at the second Corkin? No, let, let's look at night two, and let's start just because we're in the ballpark of talking about D-Courage and Yamato and the finish to night one. Can we start with the continuation of that D-Courage versus D-Courage on night two? Absolutely. So this was match five on the show. This was the pre-intermission match. Uh, it was Madoka Kakuda teaming with Dragon Kid versus Yoshi Yuki Yoshioka and Dragon Dia, the original incarnation of D-Courage, who won when Yoshioka pinned uh, Dragon Kid with a frog splash in case. I wrote this down in my notes. This was the pre-intermission match that I missed having in COVID right here. Like it was this rule. This was awesome. That that's you know that's a really good point that I hadn't really thought about was the the cork and structure has changed just through three years of COVID where they weren't doing intermissions and I kind of forgot that you're right match five is traditionally one that sort of rips and we just haven't had that for three years and this is exactly what it used to be that's a great just I don't know why that hit me the way it did but you're exactly right this was vintage match number five drangated cork and hall action and. Look, my big takeaway from this is I think the chemistry between Yoshioka and Kakuta is outstanding. I mean, I, I think these guys are going to go into Kobe world and just absolutely murder it and murder each other. And we're at a point of the year now where we sit here on June 6th. I have both of these men with 12 matches at four stars or higher this year. Many of them 
they're in the same match. They're on the same team, whether it be a tag match uh, with those guys and Ray Day Parejas or a six-man tag uh, with Dragon Daya. Here, they just missed the spreadsheet wrestling against one another. But this match made me really excited for their Kobe World main event. I throw it to you. Uh, let's say on a scale of one to ten right now, what's your excitement level for Kakuta versus Yoshioka? I'm at a healthy eight right now. We're a month out. I feel like yeah. being at an eight month out feels pretty good. I think that that they have played the unit versus unit mate thing very well, and they've I, and I think credit also for some of that and the enjoyment of that goes to Jay and Ho Ho, like talking about like no. Kakuta said it, it like we're not going to get mean about we're not going to get rude about this but if uh, if I don't feel like Yoshioka is giving it he's going to be in a world of pain because I named him for a reason I like that I think that provides a, a nice little flavor to it and it's going to be fun to see and Hakata how they're going to try to build from this because I feel perfectly satiated for this main event match I don't know if there's really anything you need to do to soak the fire I think over the next four weeks by the time i mean we have the kobe art center show the night before i think i feel like that by the before the night before naturally i would be at a nine or 9.5 like like they're, they're on the way there okay that's that's good to hear because i'm with you you know like i said last week and i was pretty emphatic about this and i stand by it the the match announcement is the build do I think it's a little weird that they are teaming on these Fukuoka shows and not wrestling one another? I do. I don't know if I would have done that. I, I would have liked to have found clever ways for them to wrestle one another. I think that's very strange. But what I saw from them here, I, I am all aboard this main event. Yeah, and also a little bit of credit for this match being so good goes to Daya and DK in this. The, the, the one spot that kind of resonated with me was... Dragon Kid goes for the 619 and Drag and Dragon Daya has it so scouted that it's not just that he's ready for the kick. He kicks he he kicks him in the middle of the rotation, going, Nope, I don't want any of that. And that just it, it's something like that that like reminds you like, oh yeah, no, he Daya's the third generation dragon. He should know what his mentors like favorite moves are. And just seeing like that little thing added so much to what was primarily a successful build up match for a Dreamgate match. We had a we had a nice little undercurrent of master and student going on with it as well. Yeah, very much so. This was a fun match. It, it was nice to see Yoshioka sort of establish himself the way that he did, because most of this year has been Yoshioka losing matches. You know, he was the loss post in Ray Day Parejas. He's the one that in some of these decouraged six mans, Daya needs to be protected because he's got a Brave Gate match coming up soon. Kakuta needs to be protected because he has a Dream Gate match coming up soon. Yoshioka is the one taking the fall. And you look at the last minute of this match, and Yoshioka was just so vicious and so intense in the way that he beat up Dragon Kid. It's a great finish, and it was it was the reset that he needed. So we're going forward, you knew that he was going to be in good shape. And it is his classic Dreamgate finishing stretch. To, yes. Like putting it back in our mind that, oh yeah, he goes usually a uh, bone mace. Uh, oh no, he first goes battle hook, bone mace, then frog splash, it's over. Like a dive. And it was like nice seeing like, oh yeah, that's Yoshioka. Not that I do, completely forgot from February that Yuki Yoshioka has one of the best frog splashes in the business. And when he hits you with it, that's it. It just was one of those things that jogs your your brain four weeks out, going like, all right, now I wonder if he hits that battle hook, is Kakuda going to be able to withstand that rush that no one else was able to last year? Yeah, very much so. Do you want me to just look at, go through the card from bottom to top before we talk about the rest of it? I, I do, yeah. The attendance on this show, the second night in Cork and Hall, it was 1,038 fans. And it's kind of, that's that's the level they've been in. You know, I don't I don't have any big picture attendance thoughts there. That's just kind of where they've existed uh, since the uh, restrictions were lifted in the spring. Yeah, and uh, the, the typhoon rolling through, I'm certain that, that walk-ups were hurt with that as well. But let, let, let's get into the rundown. So unlike the... Uh, show on the first this one does require a dragon gate network subscription it will be up until june 16th so you have plenty of time to check out the much stronger half of the cork and double header which opened with the veteran team of masaki mochizuki don fuji and naruki doi scoring a, a win over the future team of minorita daiki yanagiuchi and ryoya tanaka it was masaki mochizuki with a buzzsaw kick on yanagiuchi that was really putting his head in the third row it, it was it was nice to see 
UT and Ho Ho Loon, a rare star cross tag team, they teamed up against Palm Dragon and Punch Stone Monaga. Well, uh, UT won with the Fuego in four minutes and 42 seconds. Uh, the, 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 that's enough about that. Uh, Jason Lee was on commentary and they were talking about Brave Gates stuff instead. Uh, J- Jason was burying everybody under the sun. It was like a, a RF video shoot interview with Jason. However, he does want to have a long title run, like how we've suggested. Yeah, but you know, Ho Ho's too heavy. Wait, you can't believe Punch Tamanaga held the Brave Gate belt. Oh my God, it was excellent. Yeah, yeah, it really was just like the 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 Brave Player Haters Ball for five minutes. <laughs> match three, singles match. Kagatora pins La Estrella with a Tobinui. It got kind of grapply. It was it was a fun one. Uh, gold class. Kota Minoru, Binke, and BB Hulk. They pin. Yamato Eita and Takashi Yoshida. It was it was BB Hulk with the first flash, pretty by the numbers. And then we had that D Courage versus D Courage match, Madoka Kakuda, teaming with Dragon Kid versus Yuki Yoshioka and Dragon Daya. Semi main event, 10 man tag, basically an all out war. Felt like it. KZ, Big Boss Shimizu, Jason Lee, Strong Machine J, and Jackie Funky Kamei of Natural Vibes versus the full complement of Zebrats, Shun Skywalker, Diamante, Kai, Hio, and Ishin. Diamante got the win with a Vuelta finale after a 15-minute uh, chaos fest. And then the main event of Night 2, the Open the Twin Gate Championship match, Noah's Congo, consisting of Shuji, Kondo, and Kano, fail in their second defense. The original tag team of Susumu Mochizuki and Azushi Kanda when the the open the Twin Gate titles for the first time, it's Yazushi Kanda's first ever Twin Gate title win, and he gets that win when he countered the Gorilla Clutch into a Candy Magic. Maybe Kano did not help out things when he was trying to get uh uh the, trying to get Kanda away from the apron and trying to do that. There might have sent Kano over, allowing for the Candy Magic. But nonetheless, M3K are the open the Twin Gate champions. Which do you want to talk about first? you want to talk about Zebrats versus Natural Vibes? Or you want to talk about the main event? Let's talk about the 10-man tag first, just because okay. with, with, with that, we can finally get into the cage match. Uh, yeah, please walk us through that. Yeah, so it, the, the finish of this match, this was a complete and utter just chaotic brawl, just a wild-ass brawl. It was awesome. It, it was really... I, I, this match put a smile on my face. I just loved what this match was. Yeah, and it's a lot of this is the uh, uh, relationship and the, uh, the the feud between Shun Skywalker and Strong Machine J. Very much was the highlight of this match. Uh, Strong Machine J's mask has not stayed on his head much in recent weeks, and just the fire we got from Shun Skywalker and Strong Machine J, especially Strong Machine J, in the lead up to the finish, completely clearing the le- the ring, which sadly left Jackie Funk Kame in the ring with Diamante to get stuck with the Volta finale. And then after the, uh, sh- should we go over the uh, stuff from the night before? Yeah, please. Yeah, that? please walk us through it. So the, the, this is why I kind of wanted to talk about the cage match here, because in the semi main event, the, uh, of the first night, the Shun Skywalker and strong machine J singles match. It was a moonsault double knees that got it. But after that, a complete unmasking, brawl between shun skywalker and strong machine j uh they start doing mass challenges then diamante and dragon kid hit the ring as it was mentioned on commentary dragon kid has been appointed the emissary from ultimo dragon that was the first video package we had on that night as ultimo dragon accepted finally the challenge of diamante for a singles match and in fact he would be willing to have any kind of of singles match possible including risking his match Shun heard all this, and he says, hey, there's four guys who want to risk their match. I remember last time we did that. Maybe instead of having two matches, we should have one again. Shun Monte versus Strong Machine J and Ultimo Dragon. GM Rio Saito was kind of overwhelmed by this and needed to take a day to, over, to think things through. And that day ended after the 10-man tag. Uh, GM Rio Saito gets in the ring. Everyone is mass gripping like crazy. And Rio Saito sets... For Kobe World, a steel cage survival mask match between Strong Machine J, Shun Skywalker, Diamante, and Ultimo Dragon. They found a way, Case, to make 
this Ultimo versus Diamante match happen. Do you think this is a desperate attempt at selling tickets, or do you think this is kind of right in line with the the usual Dragon Gate wackiness in their in their booking structure? I actually think this is really inspired. I, I agree. Go ahead. Yeah, go off. Go off, King. Yep. So, Case, I dropped this to you in our messages all while I was watching this. One of the big things that we had over the uh, the three years that Diamante has been in the company was that we knew that eventually him and Ultimo were going to have a mass match. That's been pretty much been the overwhelming storyline of those two since 2020, correct? Yes. But the prob- there, there's a big problem about this, that there was a foregone conclusion in this match. There is no expectation whatsoever that Ultimo Dragon is going to lose his mask in his career. There's just no reason. The, he's reached that certain part that he's not hurting for money, and it's just he's a lot more valuable with the mask on than it off. So Diamante was going to lose his mask. We've talked about this with Dragon Gate J on air, like the expectation of this. It was a foregone conclusion, but the problem about that case is that how much does Diamante's mask really add to Ultimo? Zero. There's nothing that D- that Ultimo Dragon ultimately gained from unmasking Diamante. He's Ultimo fucking Dragon. Do I need to like? I I need to basically have the audio component of the GIF of him with the J crown next to him. There, there there's nothing that adds to that. No, so, people people lose their minds when he works a Noah show. They gift the comeback that he does in every single match, and then the com- oh, he's still got it. It's like he does this on every Dragon Gate show. What are you talking about? Yeah, he's fine. But. But am I wrong in saying that Diamante's mask, which is a valuable thing, completely worthless if Ultimo gets it because he's Ultimo Dragon. What yeah, does that he, get him? he's established as just what he is. Right. So they had to find a way, or they found a way now to do this. And they found a way to get the unmasking done and not waste Diamante's mask on Ultimo. You have the cage match. And what you can do and what they've managed to do is case I I'm calling my shot here. This is what I think is going to happen in the cage match. This is the best way and the easiest way for one person to gain a whole lot of credibility case. Strong machine J is taking the mask and this is really? how it's going to happen. Okay. Yep. Yeah, all right. Walk me through this. All right. All right. Go ahead. So I think that we are going to see. Strong Machine J will be the last person in the ring grabbing the last flag. He escapes with his mask. He gets the match at Diamante, and Shun turns on Diamante because Shun only cares about his mask at the end of the day. That was the storyline of December 1st, 2021, right? Yeah. The storyline was that as soon as things got testy, he threw Dragon Daya under the bus to save his mask. Who's to say that he's not going to do that again with Diamante? I, I think that's extremely likely. So, it, you know, Ultimo gets out first. Yep. Shun gets out second by turning on Diamante. And then you're sort of left with Jay and Diamante. And, and Jay is, is probably more so the one that survives than the one that takes Diamante's mask, if that makes sense. Is that how kind of how you're looking at it? Right. And you exit Kobe World now with a Diamante who's prepped for a big face turn. He's yes. turned on by the heel group. He is unmasked. He gets to... Join Bing K and and accomplishing all the dreams of the fans, as Gold Class likes to say nowadays. Strong Machine J, no longer the sixth in the Big Six, because he now has a giant credit to him. He he was the one who took Diamante's mask. It was not Ultimo. The the match result will appear when on the charts on your wikias will say winner Strong Machine J, loser Diamante. That's true. That's true. That's a good point. I, I think it's brilliant. I think that, yes, it's a little bit gimmicky. Yes, they kind of created, they solved a problem with their own creation, but you, you've looked at that, how they, that ultimately we spent a lot of the show, whenever we talk about Ultimo and Diamante, trying to grapple with how this match happens. They found their way out of it, Case, and they found their way out of it in a uniquely Dragon Gate kind of way. Uh, you know, you you sold me on that to the point. I was largely on your side to begin with, but I have nothing to add. That's that's a great point, very well explained. Let me ask you this. We're, we're a month out of Kobe World right now. Should get the full card next week. Your gut tells you right now, what goes on last? 
Kakuta versus Yoshioka or the cage match. You see, that's or, the Yam- or, or Yamato versus Hiromu, I guess. I think that you're doing the company a massive disservice if Hiromu's in the main event. Show some pride. You're bringing him in. Yes, he's a bigger star than anyone in your company, but he can't main event your biggest show of the year like this. I think it yes. has to be Yoshioka versus Kakuta. I understand, and there has been in the past, Dreamgate matches not main eventing Kobe Worlds before. But some of that is because of Shimaism. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, it was Shima versus Magnitude Kishiwada in a no ropes match, and they headlined with that because Shima's like, well, we, you know, we took the ropes down. We're, we're going to put them back up. You know, let's just, we have to go on last. We took the ring apart. <laughs> it's so great. It, <laughs> yeah, it, it's it, like, well, what are we going to do? And, you know, we can't go to intermission and just put the ring back together. We have to go on last. <laughs> do you think he has any interesting <laughs> trademarks? Speaking of today's news, uh, Shima? Yeah. Did you not see the news about Jeff Jarrett? No, no, what happened? Jeff Jarrett has filed the trademark for the phrase heat. Oh, God. You know, <laughs> I'm going to give two really negative opinions really quick, okay? Oh, oh totally well, well, unrelated to Dragon Gate. Can I, can I do just, this will be one minute. You, you know what? We've made 90 minutes into the show. We've done our serious bit. Let's have a little bit of fun. What are your two serious takes? Your bad I, takes. I, I am so over this Jeff Jarrett thing because, look, I didn't like when he came into the company, but he's been objectively fun. But all of a sudden, Tony Khan has just surrounded himself with the failures from TNA wrestling in ex WWE people. And all of a sudden, the shows don't feel like AEW anymore. And we're, ha ha ha, you know, Double J, he always wins. And we're not looking at the fact that he always wins, but he's also a, a, a lifelong loser. And he is somebody who, for 20 years, we complain about, you know, how how in the world are the only people that have power in wrestling, a McMahon, a Jarrett, or a Russo? Uh, we're, we just went back to the same thing. You know, time does not heal all wounds, and I have no interest in Jeff Jarrett in modern wrestling. That, that act has run its course, and I am back to being extremely anti-Jeff Jarrett. That's take number one. Any thoughts on that? You know, it, 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 it's something that, like, it... I'm very of two minds about Jeff Jarrett because I, on the whole, greatly agree with what you said. You know, like, it, it is something that it's just like, why why is Sanjay Dutt your number two? Like, like what steps have made you want to do that? Like, well, like, there is that. And with, like, Jeff Jarrett getting more involved with, like, live events. But there is still, like, the little bit of itch that he is one of the more naturally funny wrestlers that, like, I'm sorry, I lost my shit watching... Jeff Jarrett and Satnam Singh at Mark Briscoe's farm with Papa Briscoe. I love it. It's great. That. It was great. But I'm it, I'm over it. Yeah, yeah. You don't need to have that be that 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 character or that group do anything else really. Like they can go to whatever rampage is going to be and then until the next time Jeff Jarrett has something profoundly funny to do. Ready for take number two? Let's do this, baby. Eddie Kingston of the G1. Can we just can we fucking pump the brakes on that? Okay. I have no belief whatsoever that he can stay healthy for a G1 tour. This is a man that has never been healthy in his entire career, partially because he's never in ring shape and the most grueling tour in wrestling. I don't think he's making it through that. And worse is if he does make it through that. Now we're going to have to deal with that hacky, like bullshit, hyper realistic selling that he does where, you know, he's like, falling over in the middle of matches and he can't run the ropes and he's like yelling at red shoes like oh dog my ankle's fucked up my ankle's fucked up i can't continue we're gonna have to deal with that i the ugh, the eddie kingston thing sometimes man i just can't take him i just i just can't deal with that corny ass wrestler and now i'm gonna have to watch him in the g1 i am not looking forward to that I, I guess I'm playing counterpoint for you with these because I have a counterpoint on why Eddie Kingston in the G1 is profoundly funny. Okay. If he's in the same block as evil, he's going to get garroted by Dick Togo. And he and he's going to do that selling with the groat. And, and th- yeah, and then, you know, again, because he likes your gifts of all Japan wrestling, 
you're gonna go oh eddie's eddie's a real one for that it's like oh get real this fucking guy <laughs> it's just i don't know i look i said in the cm punk eddie kinks feud, i said i think cm punk's the baby face here for calling eddie kinks with a bum i or do we not all think that and apparently we don't all think that I just it's I I just like the creative ways that Tony Khan has found not to book Eddie Kingston on his TV show that allegedly is getting is about to get 1.2 billion dollars a year if you hear from reporting. Yeah, I, I, I yeah I find I find the guy to be corny. I wish I wish he was working Masawa era Noah, where like Steve Carino tells that story where Masawa just hated him. Cause I think part of it was that he found out that Karina was just a big Japanese wrestling mark and Masawa just had no time for that. And you know, Kingston's going to go when he's going to do his cosplay. A, you know, he's going to send out a tweet. Yo, thank you. Junakiyama for inspiring me. And then we're just going to eat it up. Cause I guess that's what we do now. And I, I don't know. I just, I look, he's capable of having very good matches. I've seen some Eddie Kingston work over the last few years that I have really enjoyed, but Oh God, I don't, I, him and the G1, oh, it sucks, <laughs> it's gonna suck, you know, you know he's gonna get hurt, he has no wind, he has no cardio, and then if he doesn't get hurt, we're gonna have to deal with his bullshit selling that I can't stand, and then Phil Schneider's gonna write some deal about how Eddie Kingston's the best worker in the G1, and Okada can't lace his boots, and I'm gonna get annoyed all over again. I mean, arguably the best worker in the G1 is the person who gets put over the most and does takes less bumps. Like objectively, yeah. that, that I, <laughs> I, I, I objectively that that's just the way I kind of look at it. Uh, I, I I guess like for Eddie in there, like yeah, there is like the the like the overwhelming like cringe factor about it that I I can't disagree with you. Do you think that Kawada knows who Eddie Kingston is? No, and Kawada doesn't give a fuck about Eddie Kingston either. Do, do, do you think that like Tai Chi is going to go like oh the, the, this guy worships Kawada? Oh. He is going to go, ugh, this guy sucks. He worships Kawada. <laughs> like, he's just, I don't know. I, I, the, sometimes the like discourse around Eddie Kingston, like he's this wrestling savant. It's just like, eh, I don't know. This guy has sucked for 20 years. And he just happened to, to uh, work with John Moxley at the apex of his career. And, you know, that has done him wonders, believe it or not. And you know me, I'm not even the biggest Moxley fan, but. Uh, I'll take Moxley seven out of seven days over Eddie Kingston. I just, I, I don't know what that guy. Getting existential for a second, would you say that they're like two ends of the same spectrum? Because you have like the overwhelming vibes guy and then the guy that can overwhelmingly come off as cringe. I, I could go along with that. I certainly, I, I can't come up with an argument against it. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that that's why like, like you never hear anything like, like about, about Moxley. Because Moxley, everyone's just like, oh yeah. He's not going to come up to Kawada and ask him questions. Moxley doesn't care. No, and Kingston is just a try hard. And, you know, he's one of those guys that I guess we have to pretend to like because he likes the same kind of wrestling we do. And, yeah, you know, it's whatever. So do you think the cage match is headlining Kobe World or the Dream Gate match? I think that you do the cage match coming back from intermission. And then you go in because you'll have a lot of video packages for the uh, Dream Gate match. I, I, I feel like you could do cage set up during intermission then you 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 do yamato versus uh hiromu pre-intermission or like that one because dragon gate for some reason likes doing almost all the card then intermission in the last two matches i think it goes yamato hiromu intermission cage is built during intermission cage match you have all the video packages leading into the main event you could break down the cage main event i i think you're probably right because i don't think if if we all assume it's going to be Diamante unmasked, and I think he's the overwhelming betting odds favorite here. I mean, Ultimo doesn't make any sense. I think Strong Machine J is more valuable with his mask than without. I think Shun is more valuable with his mask than without. I think Diamante is more valuable without his mask than without. So we're looking at a situation where Diamante is losing the mask. I don't think you can close Kobe World with that. No. You know, we, we have to look beyond the gimmick nature of the match. We... Kobe World can't close with a Diamante angle, and he is over. He is very over, but I don't think he's that level of over. I think you still do Kakuta versus Yoshioka there. I like the way you laid that out. Yeah, and I just, I just look at that, and you, you, you've invoked Big Six. You have made that now. Like, there's a reason why that, like, that's become the overwhelming topic on the program for, for the last month because that is your era shift. That is your tonal moment. You're going to want to have. Yes, Strong Machine J and Shun Skywalker are members of the Big Six, the Reiwa Big Six, but you're going to want to have 
Kakuda or Yoshioka staying there with the title. Like it's just it's just how like you should do it, I think. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. I I'm with but, you there. So case, uh Yazushi Kanda Susumu Mochizuki, are we certain after uh Cork and I, I I brought this up like a month ago about them, and now I'm pretty certain. Are we certain they're not the tag team of the year? Man, you know, I said I needed more time. I, I, I said, let me get one more great Susumu and Kanda match, and then we can have that conversation. And sure enough, we got the best Yasushi Kanda match of his entire life. I mean, what in the hell was this main event? It is something special. That's what this was. It It, it is something that, like, entirely built around Kanda, but in the same way, requiring so much of Susumu to have, like, a performance of this, where building off of the night before, uh, Shuji Kondo relentlessly tacked Yazushi Kanda's knee with the idea of he he's been around the block long enough to know that more often than not this tag team finishes with the combination kamikaze and elbow drop kanda can't climb that turnbuckle if he doesn't have a knee so that became the focus of this match and then from there shuji kondo savagery kano doing the pfs from from the apron to the floor within the first three minutes was one of the more nasty things case i've seen in the last few years this was just such a brilliant match from beginning to end. You know, a, a lot of the first Quark and show felt like a waste of time. It, it felt like inside inconsequential matches that, you know, we'll never really hear, you know, see any payoff to. And I noted specifically after the, the first Quark and show, they did, uh, what was that match? I, I lost track of it here. Uh, they, they did Mochizuki, Masaki, Susumu Mochizuki and Yasushi Kanda versus problem dragon, Shuji Kondo, and Takashi Yoshida. That certainly was an exciting match on paper, but the match was built around Shuji Kondo sort of brutalizing, pilmanizing, if you will, Yasushi Kondo's knee. And it went, okay, all right, that's a simple story. They're building for night two. It makes sense there. And then we have this match. First interaction between Kano and Yasushi Kondo. Kano kicks his leg. Kondo immediately rolls to the outside. Immediately we have the story set there. Like you said, diving double stomp to the ankle on the floor. A few minutes later, we have two different times where Kanda gets on the ring apron, tries to save Susumu. They take out his knee. All right. Hot tag to Kanda. He comes in, still injured, doing his thing, a little bit of a run from M3K, and then Kano and Kondo take over once again. And then we just hit this point somewhere in the match. And I, I don't know specifically where it turns. Maybe it's the John Woo that they hit on Kondo. It just, it becomes a war. And it's Susumu and Kano, and it's Kanda and Kondo, and they are giving everything they have. And Kanda is putting on the performance of a lifetime. This is a guy in 2023. He's wrestled on and off for 20 years. He has had two of the three best matches of his entire career this year the Ray Day Parejas finals. And this match, which I think is the best match of his entire career. The only one that comes close, the only other one that comes to mind is his Dreamgate match versus Masaki Mochizuki in 2011. And I got news for you. Mike and I could have put a four and a quarter star matchup against Masaki Mochizuki that year. All right. It's not as impressive as it sounds. I this, used to accept of having brain damage. That's how you do it. Yeah, you just, just get kicked in the face as hard as humanly possible. Uh, I, this was, I mean, the spot that I can't get over. Kano has Kanda in an ankle lock. And Kanda starts to climb uh, to an upright position. And sort of as he's upside down trying to get out of the ankle lock, Shuji Kondo spears him. And I popped for it. Ho-Ho popped for it. Jay popped for it. And Jay, yo, Jay said what I said when I was sitting on the couch watching it. I've never seen that before. That was insane. And I think that is what makes this match so special is not only was it the singular greatest Yasushi Kanda performance there's ever been, and I have news for you, there will ever be. This was the perfect use of Shuji Kondo. This was one of the singular best Kondo performances I've ever seen, because this is a 17-minute match. He was just a wrecking ball for 17 minutes. Whenever he was in the ring, he was causing havoc. And this is motivated guy with something to do, Shuji Kondo. And when that is the case, oh man, there's only a short list of guys better than him. And it was something that it, everyone gets invested in this match. It's not just 
everyone at ringside. It's Rio Saito audibly on camera gasping when Kanda kicks out of the King Kong Lariat. It is something that the it's reminiscent of those 2013, 2014 Corkin crowds for the first time in nine years. It is something where like you at a moment, and I think you get the added dimension of because of attendance, you got to hear a little bit of a Congo uh delegation for the first time ever at a Dragon Gate show. We actually got to hear some no offense with that. But it felt like a war. It felt like the sides like to the point where Kano is go is trying to go high kicks as much as possible, and each time he throws one, Sasumi Yokosuka lariats it down, and each of them, each time they throw it, it's a little less zing behind it. They're hurting a little bit more, and at the end, with you have the final stretch around the Gorilla Clutch, where it surely looks like that everything is coming up Congo's way until Kanda is able to. It's either like a momentum thing or is able timing was able to roll through with the candy magic and the shock that I feel like that the crowd had that scoring the fall there felt incredibly deserved after the 17 minutes before that. Did you know the result going into the match? Yeah, because Dragon Gate's Twitter posted it. Okay. I So I knew that in 3K won. I didn't know what the finish was. And the one spot that you glanced over there was at one point, Susumu kind of trips up Kondo on the outside and then slides the box into the ring. And I see that happen. I go, oh, you know, okay, great match. It's kind of a bummer. Kondo's going to hit Kondo with the box and, and get the win, and we'll go from there. And no, Shuji Kondo just lariats the box, and it becomes a moot point. And that was just another one of those, like, what what am I watching here? Like, why is this match as good as it is? And then they get into, like you said, you know, the aforementioned uh, Gorilla Clutch. Kano stomps on Kanda gives Kondo a chance to move him back to the middle of the ring, and then uh, Kanda flips it, Candy Magic, they get the win. I, I mean, I this is this is a top 10 match for me this year, without a doubt. It's my number two Dragon Gate match of the year, uh, just slightly behind Skywalker versus Kakuta. This is, you know, to me, this generation's uh, Yoshino and Sachi Hoko Boy versus Susumu and Kagatora, which, look, Susumu, another all-time great tag team match, one of the best wrestlers to ever live. I I went four and three quarters on this. I'm blown away at how good this match was. I was four and a half, and maybe it. it I adore the Ray De Perry House match. I love the fact that the first spot is dual dives from two guys of a combined age of ninety over like that, and it it just was like a tempo there, like with the Al Capoco tornado, like everything there. That that match is still my Dragon Gate match of the year, and. I, this one's not far behind. It is something really special. It, it's a match that I think will survive history better than the Ray Perejas House finals. I think that's fair to say. Yeah, I look. I like I said, this was this is a top ten match. Yeah, I just watched a bunch of good New Japan stuff over the weekend. There's obviously AEW stuff that I, I'm going to think very highly of, and you've got you know Okada versus Danielson and Omega versus Osprey two right around the corner. The top 10 is going to be loaded this year. You know, there's going to be a lot of high-end wrestling to contest uh, when it comes match of the year time. I feel very confident this will hold up against some of those matches. The, I I mean, I was just I'm blown away by this. Now, Case, I'm going to ask you again. Are we certain that Konda and Susumu aren't the tag team of the year? I, I still, even with him being out for a month now, I still prefer the work that Masaki Mochizuki and Mochizuki Jr. have done. The the thing that holds Susumu and Kanda back is I did not go notebook on any of their Ray de Parejas block matches. Obviously, they killed it in the finals. I did not think they had I did not think they had the best tournament as a whole. You know, I'm trying to look at here real quick just sort of what they did in that tournament i I think i was much higher on their block play matches like i had one that was near four the uh, double dragon match i felt like was one of their more stronger matches during that but that is fairly the uh the the trackment that you would say with them because it really is something that there were some of those matches during rated prejas with those two in it that felt interminably long yeah, so they did, they did the Strong Machines, they did the Double Dragons, they did Kai and, and Shun, they did Ben and Minorita and Doi and Yamato, and I don't really remember loving any of those, again, up until the 
uh, Hulk and Minora semifinals, and then the obviously the finals versus Kakucha and Yoshioka, which was spectacular. So they won the Twin Gate belts that I didn't see coming. I, I did not realize until the match was over. It was the first time Condad won the Twin Gate belts. I just assumed at some point he would have won them and he had not. So it's a historic moment there. And uh, we also have a, a Twin Gate match set for Kobe World now. Yeah, that's right. Uh, in retrospect, it makes perfect sense who they are. I, in the post-match, uh, Ben K and uh, BB Hulk come out, lay out the challenge for Dead or Alive. Ben K had a tendency this weekend to never get off the microphone. Did you did you notice that? Ben K I just adored, would not stop I, talking. He, he, he cut a promo from backstage during night one. It was the best thing I've ever seen. Yeah, he is really feeling himself. It, it, yeah, because he cut a promo after the gold class match on the first night. We have the setup here. Uh, I really kind of liked what I was seeing from Hulk and Ben. I think that, that there's something to it, and I think it's it's suitable, I guess I would say, for a Kobe World match. I mean, first defense and, and all this. Uh, what was your what, what's your feeling about this? Where are you at for the Twin Gates? I, I think it's okay. I, I don't love BB Hulk being in this Twin Gate match here. But Ben deserves a big match. I think he's put in that level of work. And, you know, if, if Hulk's going to be the guy, that's, you know, I, I'll live with that. I, I, I There's a lot of room for error with Konda and Hulk being in a big match at Kobe World. It's kind of weird we're in that position given all the youth that we've had. But Susumu and Konda are hot right now. Ben K is very hot right now. And, and BB Hulk has been more reliable than I think any of us expected this year. So I don't I don't love it, but I'm sure it'll be fine. I think that we are that this match gets a lot of benefit by the fact that you have Yamato and Hiromu and the cage match. Whereas normally you would expect this to be second from the top. This would be a very weak second from the top match at Kobe yes, World. Yeah, very much so. I can't I look at this and I think this match might go before the trial gate match. Yeah, yeah, we will we will see. It's it, it, you know, well let's do you want to just look at what we have right now for Kobe world. And that'll kind of bring us to the last two announcements that were made on that, on that Kobe show. Yeah, let's do that. So as we said, we have six matches fully announced and signed for Kobe world. Of course, the open, the dream gate title match, Madoka Kakuta defending against Yuki Yoshioka, the twin gates, uh, the new champion team, the original tag team, Susumu and Kanda defending against gold classes, Binke and BB Hulk. However, on the June 4th Kobe Sambo Hall show, the rest of the title picture kind of came into picture a little bit clearer as after the Royal Sambo, Ishin laid out the challenge for Jason Lee with the caveat that Ishin right now is at 88 kilos. Of course, the Brave Gate title is only for wrestlers 82 kilos or under. So Ishin has to make weight and they have set the deadline for the Night before Kobe World, our Kobe Art Center show, we will see if Ishan is able to make 82 kilos. If he does not, this becomes a non-title matchup. And then also, after the main event of the Kobe Sambo Hall show, really strong D Courage versus Natural Vibes match, by the way. Uh, Gold Class comes out again to set out a trial for, a, a challenge for the Triangle Gates. It is Minora. Minorita, and then they say they want to reunite original gold class Naruki Doi, who immediately turns it down. There's a whole lot of confusion. GM Rio Saito says, that's okay. I have a new wrestler that will fit in there. He's a great wrestler. It's also Naruki Doi, who then ha is forced to come back out, because Rio Saito has already signed this match. So at, at Kobe World, for the Triangle Gate, we have KZ Big Boss Shimizu and Jackie Funky Kamei defending the Open the Triangle Gate titles against the original Gold Class pairing of Kota Minora, Minorita, and Naruki Doi. That's great stuff. Yeah, this is this is a loaded card. I love what they did here with Gold Class. I would recommend watching that angle on the Dragon Gate Network if you have not seen it. Uh, the Brave Gate stuff. I mean, it's Jason and Ishan. I think that's an awesome match. I I love a public weigh-in gimmick. That is a uh, something that's going to hit for me every single time they do it. And Jason versus Ishan, we've never seen that, and that should be excellent. Yeah, and Ishan with this modified scrap buster, he's now hitting out of nowhere. Like the uh, the, the the closing stretch on this Royal Sambo was uh, Estrella going for one of his uh, handsprings into 
Casadora into a arm drag takeover into a pin. Um, Ishan decided nah. And then he just picked him up and did the modified scrap buster to win the match. And it, it, it's fascinating because the, the the thing of Ishan's like transformation has been because he's been bulking up and embracing his sumo heritage. Now suddenly, six kilos, that's about 13.2 pounds he's going to have to lose over the next four weeks. Should be interesting. Like I said, I love a public weigh-in. I think that is such a terrific gimmick. Hey, I feel like they should get... Uh, 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 Koji and Ricky and get uh, Ishan or get Ricky back out there. I mean, they are bodybuilders now. Embrace they look the family insane. heritage. We we have those photos on the Open the Voice Gate Twitter. If you dig back just a little bit, the the recent bodybuilding competition that Ishan Ricky and his son Ricky Hashi did, they they both just look insane. The vascularity of these men. Oh, the cornrows. Yeah, the, I I'm sorry. Like I can't unsee Ricky Hashi and cornrows. He's like a normal looking dude when he wrestled in Dragon Gate, and then he's he's not now. Yeah, yeah. And and then the Triangle Gate setup here. I I think that this does a lot of good for a lot of people here. It kind of answers your your Shimizu and KZ question. Minora, who was kind of like the big six member, a little bit left out in the cold, it felt like, storyline wise, as Minora promised that he would not be interjecting in the uh, Dreamgate festivities, which was something that the crowd like uh, reacted to Gold Class coming out after a decouraged microphone talk segment hyping out the Dreamgate match. I thought that was fun, but you, you, you're you able to highlight two of your smaller members of your roster, Minorita and JFK. You get a good position for Naruki Doi where he's not just in a touch football match, and you get like an opportunity here where... KZ and Minora, those two guys are just going to throw bows. So I, I I, think that they've picked four really strong title matches now that we have this portion of the Kobe world to figure it out, Case. Yeah, just to summarize again, Kakuta versus Yoshioka for the Dreamgate, uh, Mochizuki and Kanda, that is Susumu Mochizuki and Yasushi Kanda versus Ben K and BB Hulk for the Twin Gate, KZ, Shimizu, and Jackie Funky Kame versus Doi, Minora, and Minorita for the Triangle Gate, Jason Lee versus Ishin Likely for the Brave Gate, a four-way cage match, Mascara Contra Mascara, Ultimo Dragon, Strong Machine J, Shun Skywalker, and Diamante, and Yamato versus Hiromu. And we still have yet-to-be-announced matches specifically for Eita, Kano, Shuji Kondo, and Toro Nohashi, the Torimon X graduates. Yeah, the, it, it's going to be interesting because you also have Dragon Kid that's not involved really in anything they have to deal with, and 3K. Like, what's Mochizuki going to do now? Like, it looks like Junior is about ready to get back in the ring. He might have missed Kobe World, but but not by long. There's a lot of interesting figures that have been left out that I hope, dear God, we don't have a Dragon Royal instead to get every, all of them on the card. That would that would be such a bummer, but, you know, Mochizuki Junior is booked for the Bayouden show a week after World. So I'm really hoping he is back on World. So... Like you said, you know, no, no Dragon Kid, you know, in terms of matches booked yet. Uh, Dragon Kid doesn't have a match. Masaki Mochizuki doesn't have a match. Dragon Daya doesn't have a match. Uh, nothing from Hyo, nothing from Kai, and I'm trying to think of anybody else that's relevant. And that's, uh, you know, we'll see what the young guys do. I would, I would love a. Uh, Maybe the young guys get in there with Kano. That'd be I. I'm I want Kano and Dragon Gate so bad. Kano just, and Kongo oh my God. get a. Here, here's what I'm pitching here. Instead of the Battle Royal, if you have less than three years experience, you're invited to the Congo Challenge. And here's what the Congo Challenge is: it's Kano and Shuji Kondo. Kondo needs something to do on the show too. And what's going to happen is basically everyone from Rio Fuda on is going to be in an endless gauntlet. That's how we're going to do it. I love that. I mean, you could, you know, do Ata. I don't know. I well, I, I look. I don't care about ruining Noah's booking because Noah is ruining Noah's booking. Do Ata and Kondo and Kano versus Fuda and Nagano and either Daiki or Tanaka? Because I'm assuming Yoshiki Kato won't be back. He's still dealing with eye surgery, which is such a bummer because he was so hot at the start of this year. But he, he, you know, needs to be able to see. So I get it, but. And there's just there, there's a lot you can do even with the guys that aren't booked yet. This is an excellent looking card. Yeah, uh, 
and, and the, the thing about uh, Yoshiki Kato not returning yet in my Congo challenge, he would be the last person and it would become a time limit draw as time would elapse because because Shuji Kondo gets tired and he can't that's take a, down. That, that's good booking. I mean, they should give me the pencil, man. Well, you, <laughs> you brought up Bu- Buyaden. That was the announcement for Mr. Nakamori on the uh, second night. Do you want me to run through the card real quick? Run through the card real quick. We'll have plenty of time to preview this later. We're not going to preview it now, but run through the card to uh, whet the appetite a little bit. Yep, this one is a spicy one. We have no match order announced yet. We have, they are returning the Awara Gate case. I thought I heard a scream coming from the northwest in my direction sometime around 6 a.m. on Friday, but the Awara Gate's back. It is the interim champion, Konamawa Ichikawa, as as Shingo Takagi probably has something better to do on this day, who is accepting challengers to see who will be the the next Oare Gate champion. Konamawa Ichikawa has said he wants the most interesting wrestlers possible to have the most interesting match in the match where the result does not matter. It's what the fans think to decide the Oare Gate. Six-man tag, Benke, Minorita, and Puncho Managa versus Hikaru Sato, Takumi, uh, or Takafumi Ito, and Ryo Kawamura. Six-man tag, Shu, uh, Big Boss Shimizu, Muchizuki Jr., as Case mentioned before, and Daiki Yanagiuchi versus Masaka Damiya, Kai Fujimura, and Taishi Ozawa, uh, Yuki Yoshioka, and Madoka Kakuda versus Toru Nohashi and, and Musashi. And then we have, this might be a open the Twin Gate title match by the time we get there. Susumu Kanda and Yazushi Kanda versus Masato Tanaka and Takuma Sugawara. Maybe not. I oh, We don't need Sugawara around that belt. And then the last match announced, it is Yamato teaming with Masaki Mochizuki versus Fuminori Abe and private citizen Munanori Sawa. I, they, they say card order undetermined. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's the main event. That's the second scoop on this podcast. I think I think that's going to headline the second uh, Mochizuki Produce show this year. You, you don't think that Konamawa Chikawa is going to reclaim the throne as the main event? Uh, it's look it's not my main event yeah yeah couldn't be me couldn't be me and then they have announced king of gate 2023 32 man field we will talk about the full field later case did you have any big takeaways from it initially 32 man single elimination tournament i have some theories that we will get into at another time yep it will be time to decide who is dragon gates number one fighter and that will start on july 7th from Tokyo Cork and Hall, and it will finish on August 3rd. And it looks like that we'll probably get all the block, all the knockout matches, rather, on YouTube as well. Well, okay, somehow we have managed to get through this show right around two hours. Do you have anything else you wanted to touch on before we get out of here? I'm really, really excited for Kobe World the more I talk about it. And of course, I think we talked about this last week, I will be out of town. I think you're busy that weekend. I don't know. We're, we're going to cover it as soon as we possibly can cover it. But I am really excited for Kobe World this year. My birthday is July 1st. Yes. And it's my first birthday in Fort Worth. So and, we'll and what happens in Fort Worth stays in Fort Worth. It's called Cowtown for a reason, Case. <laughs> Amen, brother. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, thank you all for listening to Open the Voice Gate this week. We'll be back with you next week talking about the final card for Kobe World and they they do have a Hakata double shot happening. It, those are the last two network shows for Dragon Gate in June. Like that's it. The, all the other stuff they are going to Okinawa coming up, but it's all going to be outpost shows here on in until July. Yeah, but that will do it for us. You can follow us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. Cases at underscore in your case. I'm at Fujiheya. If you would like to support the show, one of the best ways to do that is to go to your podcast platform of choice, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, what have you, and please rate and review us five stars only, as that's the best way for folks to discover Open the Voice Gate. But that's going to do it for us this week. We'll be back with you next week talking about the road to Kobe world. Take care, everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is Taylor. And I'm Kelly. And we are the co-hosts of Jumping Bomb Audio, the podcast all about Joshi Pro Wrestling here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Every other Monday, we are with you talking about the biggest news in Joshi, along with show reviews, previews, and much, much more. 
So if you're new to Joshi or you've been a longtime fan, this is the show for you. We've got something for everyone here. So check us out, Jumping Bomb Audio. Hi, I'm Case Lowe, co-host of the Open the Voice Gate podcast. The one question I'm constantly asked when it comes to Dragon Gate is how do I get into the promotion? Well, stop asking and start listening to the Open the Voice Gate podcast released every Wednesday on the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. For exclusive news and show reviews, look no further than the leader in Dragon Gate coverage, Open the Voice Gate.